so pleased to be here. This is my I, I, 18th BrickCon, I think. Uh, I've only missed one BrickCon over the years. And uh, so, uh, and that was because I, uh, Lego Canada changed a date on me and made me, uh, I, had to, I had to commit to that and, and go to that event. So anyway, that's kind of how it worked. Um, I got lots of stuff to show you today. We're going to kind of talk about, I'm going to talk a little bit about what an LCP is uh, and what I do specifically in that role. Um, and then I'm uh, going to switch it up a little bit because I'd asked what people might want to see. And I'll talk a little bit about some designing big stuff and also sort of how I do mosaic events. So it's going to be kind of two sections and we'll have Q&A after each one. Uh, I've been in the game for a long, long time. Um, I was an AFOL and a community member that before there was hardly back talking about uh, talking to the very few people I knew in Alt Toys Lego on Usenet on, on the dial up BBS back in the early 90s. Um, and everything just grew from there. So uh, helped to start the Vancouver Lego Club, started uh, the Abbotsford Lego Club in the town where I live. Um, always was interested in becoming a, somehow a Lego employee or a Lego designer, some sort of thing, as many of us are, or many of us were. I thought, well, that's just a lost cause. I went into IT, had that as a career for many years. Um, but then the internet came around and changed everything. So like it kind of did for all of us. Um, and I thought this is now potentially a possible thing. Also, the Lego company began to open up. It became a little bit less Willy Wonka, uh, you know, where we would just have these amazing Lego products come out of the factory. We didn't have a clue what was going on behind closed doors. There was a lot more opening up um, with uh, various things through the train guys and all that sort of stuff and the, the Mindstorms partners. All that stuff was happening and the, the company was opening up. Anyway, I was uh, doing stuff with our local club, the Vancouver Lego Club, and designing layouts and, and exhibits and stuff that we could do all for free, all volunteer. And it got to a point where I was doing about two days a week doing that. And <laughs> of course, not getting paid anything. I thought, okay, something's got to give. I've either got to get paid more for doing this or uh, paid anything for doing it, or I've got to cut it back. And I decided I was going to keep doing it. So I thought, how can we make this happen? So I actually wrote a white paper and presented it to uh, Tormod Askelson and at the time Jake McKee uh, at Portland Brickfest PDX uh, way back in 2005, whatever it was. And uh, it was the whole idea of how this could work, how we could have these outside people connected with the Lego company. And I had postured two ways of doing that. What I called it the Lego Ambassador Program, and that's what ended up becoming Lego Ambassadors. Uh, and I called it Ambassador Pro. So it was these people who were sort of club members who could communicate uh, between the company and various clubs and enthusiasts, but also these ones that would take it to a next level and do events and things that uh, shopping malls, museums, science centers, uh, et cetera, would pay to have events at their, at their facility. So that, again, long, longer story, even shorter, became the LCP Lego Certified Professional Program. And this first picture is, um, the four of the original LCPs in uh, Enfield, Connecticut. You've got Dan Parker, myself looking 16 years younger, uh, Nathan Swaya, poster boy of the whole program, and of course, Sean Kenny. So I, I, let's, uh, we all know what an LCP is. Let's just move ahead. This was year w w one or year two in Enfield. Back then they had the employee store and you could buy stuff crazy, crazy cheap. We were buying, they had pick a brick back then and we'd be buying a, a bags about three times the size of a, of a pick-a-brick cup, a large one for two bucks each. You took home cases yeah. of stuff. It's fabulous. Uh, this was one of the first builds, uh, big builds I did. So I do a lot of big builds, big events, uh, where I create lots of big stuff with Duplo in a, in a place to display for two days, two months, uh, six months, whatever it happens to be. Uh, this is probably my most, if you've seen anything of my creations, it would have been this guy. Uh, this actually made it into a, a Lego calendar in 2013, um, giant Egyptian Sphinx. I built it seven times over from the ground up in different Canadian cities as it toured with an exhibit, about uh, eight feet tall. Do lots of stuff like this. This was uh, some Hong Kong skyline things. So I'm just going to whip through a bunch of creations that... Uh, 
I've made over the years. Giant Rockets as part of an event in a shopping mall. Always holiday stuff. First responders and firemen and policemen always get all the love. So I said, I'm building an ambulance. And uh, that's how it went. Giant Parrot. Most of these are like a weekend build. And then they'll stay on display for a while. Sometimes I'm doing an actual team. So this is a team on, on Vancouver Island. Uh, I think they're called the Panthers. And the goalie that this was modeled after, he actually came down and did some pictures and stuff. You get to do fun stuff like that. Halloween's always a big time. Christmas is always a big time. Little chibi pirate ship. Uh, yes, Christmas, 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 and Halloween and Easter, get all kinds of bills. Once in a while, Lego will hire me and uh, they'll hire me directly and I'm actually working directly for them. That's what LCPs do to, to a degree. So this was uh, the Lego movie two, uh, the intro for it. I went into a Toys R Us and built, a, I, think a, a, I think it was an eight times uh, scaled up version of Emmett's house. Fun build. We do a lot of stuff with developers. The idea, this, this uh, exhibit was called, or this place was called Unwritten. And so they wanted it to be Duplo and raw and kind of uh, simple. And then as they sold and developed individual buildings, they kind of added color. So the two around the back here, you can see they've got a little bit more detail, tiny bit more detail and some more color. We did that for several of them as we moved on. New commissions as well. So this is a, uh, uh, a sales office for a condo in Calgary, Alberta, uh, where they also maintained a, uh, um, uh, like a heritage building behind it beside it, so built that as well. Often work with local builders all across the country. Uh, I don't know if Dave's on, Dave Ware, on the, on the right of this building here. Dave and I did most of the work on, on this building, but a lot of other club members, uh, local people did as well. Absolutely love working with local lugs and local builders, and I do it whenever I have the chance. So there's that little commission. Uh, it was a desktop model for the, mat, for the architect of that, uh, that uh, um, big build that kind of stuff. Commissions for a museum. This is a speedboat out in Ontario and that became a, a piece that went into their exhibit full-time. And they do small ones too. So this is a, for a boat dealer. This became an auction prize actually. It sits on someone's mantle right now. Again developers. Why don't they build square buildings? Oh my goodness. Uh, so this is a new building going up in Vancouver right now called Tesoro. It looks like a helicopter on, pad on top, but it is not. It's just a really cool penthouse pad. Uh, Lego Canada also hires me to do commissions occasionally. So uh, in this case, it was for a friend's exhibit. And so these are all glued and, and kids could pick them up and, and kind of air guitar and, and kind of have fun with that. So, um, and a little funky keyboard. So that's why all the friends cover colors. And I also do kits. So here's a case where I do custom kits. This has now been sort of ceased by Lego company. Answer some uh, questions. Yeah, we do have a few questions. All right, uh, let's do are, it. Are your big builds, are they solid Lego in the core? Usually not. Uh, it all depends on how long they're gonna have to be displayed. Um, if it's gonna be a, a long-term display, there's rules that we have to follow for, for access. How, how can people touch them? Is it behind stanchions? Is it behind glass? Uh, all that sort of stuff. But often if it's a weekend build, they'll be literally on display for, for an hour or a day. In that case, they're, they're holding together. They're never going to be moved. And then we usually destroy them right in place. In fact, it's often make that part of the event. So uh, kids will actually come and help push it over and have all these Duplo bricks shattering everywhere. It's great fun. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, somebody wanted to know, they understood what LCP stood for, but what, what is it that you do? What does it mean? So what I do is everything that the Lego company essentially doesn't have a mandate to do uh, Lego related or the resources to do. So I, I go to places where, especially in Canada, we're a huge country uh, and, and it's just, it's not possible to get to every small city in the country. So I go to places generally where Lego doesn't go and I get paid by uh, the venue to be there. So it potentially becomes kind of marketing or an activity that they pay for. Uh, Lego doesn't usually get involved directly. I report to them and they need to know what's going on and we have guidelines as to what we do. 
but essentially it's events and commissions at this point. It used to be custom kits. So that's why I was gonna show you some of the custom kits, but we might have to just pass on that. Um, suffice it to say, I've done it probably about oh, 80 custom kits over the years and they're a ton of fun. I, I love doing them, um, but now the Lego company has kind of stopped us from doing those. So other questions? Uh, yes. So is being an LCP for you a full-time job or do you have uh, another job as well? No, it's full-time for me. I think uh, almost every LCP is full-time and has been from, from day one. Um, for me, I was an IT consultant before becoming an LCP. So I had the chance to kind of reduce the number of IT clients I had. I was an independent and uh, raise the number of Lego stuff I was doing. So for me, it took about two years but that was in 2004. So, I mean, I've been full-time LCP for 14 years. All right, great. What does the process look like from initial planning to building to completion? Uh, well, hopefully if we get the slides up, I can show you that. So that was one of the things that uh, I wanted to kind of show you some of the things that we kind of do. Uh, although that said, I do prefer, if I can do it, I prefer to free build as much as possible. So just make sure I got a lot of bricks on hand and then just build. So I might do a sketch. I might do a, a simple, simple geometric sketch to get some dimensions. For example, if I want that parrot to be um, six feet tall, I scale everything from that. I might take a parrot graphic and just measure how, 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 wide, how wide is his chest? Uh, how far does the beak extend past his, his eyes? That type of thing. And maybe do a couple little dimensions and then I'll just essentially free build. So, uh, I, I prefer that because you can plan forever on these things, uh, you know, for a one-time build. And I don't believe in over planning. I'd rather just trust my instincts and have lots of bricks and, and build. But that said, uh, we do have access to an in-house program that the designers use inside of Lego called Brick Builder. And that's a great tool for, I was gonna show you some, not the actual program, but some of the, some of the output of that program. If we can get the slides, uh, I will probably try that again. But, um, and then also for mosaics is another thing. So is how we do the mosaics is, uh, is how that works is I use some tools for that, obviously. Okay, thank you. Do you have special access to Lego to be able to get parts in bulk that's only available for LCPs or do you buy brick just like the rest of us? Uh, the LCPs, the biggest perk of the LCP program is yes. In fact, exactly that is be able to buy bricks in bulk. So I can buy anything that's pretty much anything that's available right now in a set on a shelf, I can buy in bulk uh, at, uh, at a wholesale price essentially. Uh, so we do pay for our brick, but we don't pay full pop for it. And we have access to, to whatever quantities are available that we need. And it's, we're talking tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands. Um, but sets, have to buy sets at the store like anybody else, we get no deals on sets. Um, and, but that's, that's how we get it. So I've often had, you know, I'll have skids of bricks showing up for an event, uh, or used to when I was doing kits, I'd have even more, you'd have, have to make 500 kits of something. And, and, you know, we have all these bricks show up in a skid and it's like Christmas opening up those boxes and the smell of fresh ABS. It's a lovely thing. All right. So talking about, uh, doing big builds and, uh, creations, uh, what kind of tools get used. So again, I mentioned brick builder. Uh, this is an actual sculpture in Vancouver called the Digital Orca, done by Douglas Copeland, who's actually a major Lego nerd and uh, super big friend of the community up there. Obviously, I wanted to build this thing. So I built it several times over the years now, but the easiest way to design it was to just take the cubes and essentially put them into, uh, into you know, the, uh, the brick builder. If you could do it in the studio, you could do it anything, but brick builder has some cool features. So let's just scroll ahead. This was just to give an idea of the, the uh, I mean, not scroll ahead, but just move forward um, to the next slide on, uh, on this one. And this of course is the cult of the whale. I just like this picture. People doing a yoga class in front of the whale, looks like they're worshiping it, it's fantastic. So that's just gives you an idea of the shape of this thing. Uh, the one I did is about a, a third the height. Um, so the idea, let's carry on here. So this is some of the things you can get. So Brick Builder lets you, it's just like a 3D pixelated art editing program. Um, now the idea here was I was gonna kind of flip between all these images, 
because you can sort of see it rotate, but you can just show these various images, um, Dan. Yeah, there you go. So, of course, you can move it all around and whatnot. And then the cool thing about um, Brick Builder is it's really designed, if you've ever watched the, 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 the images of, um, of builders actually creating Lego models in the Lego factories in Cladno and in Enfield, you'll see they have a notebook or a computer or a tablet sitting right beside them. And um, uh, what they're doing, if you go back to those funny looking graphic pictures, I go up to the top one, 21, I think. So what Brick Builder shows you is it shows you a level. A lot of the stuff they do is, is studs up. And so this is showing me a, a cross section, a, a horizontal cross section of the level 21 in that whale. And for me, I just assumed in that case that each one of those boxes is actually four Duplo studs uh, by four studs and by three bricks. So that's just, it was easy shorthand for that. Um, yeah, anyway, so this shows you a level. So what you're seeing is the funny, funny symbols there. Everywhere you see a color, that is the color on that level. So wherever you saw black, that's where black has to go. You can see some dark gray. The empty squares, and in fact, the squares that even have color on them, indicate that there is a brick above this level. And the X indicates that there was a brick below this level. So it tells you very quickly, basically, information on three levels. So it's super easy to, to build. So if, you're, if you go down to 22, look at the fin. The fin is the top left there. You see how, uh, <laughs> so Ryan McNaught, I think, is in here. He's looking at, he's looking at this. He's, he's very familiar with this. So if you carefully look now at that fin, you can see that there's some interesting squares. And it's telling me where things are vertically. Uh, above and below. Super helpful. And this is great for live building, but also you can imagine if you're gluing pieces on, uh, you can tell uh, where stuff goes. So we can just zip through that. This is a tool that I, I use sporadically. Uh, I don't use it as much because again, I like to free build. So I was totally used here though, for sure. Uh, and that was a case that was, this is at BrickCon 2016, BrickCan 2016. And uh, yeah, you can just zip through those. And then I also did it in 2017. Uh, that one with the yellow t-shirt there. I did the same thing again, just with uh, 2017 at the Lego Imagination Tour that went across Canada. So there's another little model I brought up to, to show as well. And uh, I didn't show all the, the background stuff, but just to show you that this is, if you have a 3D model, um, an OBJ file or, or any sort of 3D model, essentially this is what you end up with. Uh, so you do a lot of work to create that model. This is just output from that. And then you pop that into Brick Builder and you can actually paint voxel by voxel 3D, change things around, and you end up with the actual model. So I used that again with all those levels and built this live at this uh, TV studio in Eastern Canada. And this is what the guy ended up looking like. I skewed his head over just slightly because I, if you can draw a line from his right foot all the way up into his head, I've actually got some bracing inside there that I did on the fly uh, for him to be able to stand and, uh, not, and not fall apart. But that's an example of a tool that gets used. Um, I use some other programs now and again, but like I said, I mostly like to free build on the big stuff. Um, okay, moving on, mosaics. Uh, do a ton of mosaics. So uh, they are back in the old days, pre-COVID, uh, this was probably the most, my most requested kind of event is going and doing mosaics. So typically they'll be this size or maybe a little bit bigger. You can carry on, Dan. These are all publicly done. That one is, uh, yeah, these are both the same size. They're four by two base plates. This one is quite a bit bigger. I think this is six by four, six by three base plates. Um, yeah, carry on. Do some things like this. So this was a thing that it was actually at the Vancouver airport. Uh, uh, this one is all glued together and is actually all bolted in a, a steel frame and everything so that you can be, be behind it and, uh, you know, poke your face through for a picture. So another example. Yeah, uh, Brick Builder is an in-house program only. Uh, I'm going to show you the programs I use, old school programs I used to do these mosaics. We're going to talk about that. So this is a case, another mosaic that ended up in uh, the St. John Airport. Uh, again, was done publicly uh, at a school there. And uh, then it's permanently displayed in that, in that airport. 
The biggest one I've worked on is the next one. Uh, this was for the Halifax Discovery Center. And uh, again, uh, you can see the little sections of it, not quite done, but this one I think was uh, 16 base plates by eight base plates, big base plates. So that's uh, about 20 feet wide by 10 feet tall. Uh, it took months to, build, months to do it, you know, a lot of pieces. So how do I do them? So go to the next slide there. So this is kind of the thing I show clients as to how it's gonna kind of be, how we do these things, what's gonna look like. So you can kind of ignore the framing type of thing, but effectively we'll have base plates prepared on a surface, whether it's my own surface that I bring, or it's, uh, it's stuck on a wall or whatever it's gonna be. And then I'll have these little, pan I call them panels, little sections. And uh, that's the, the little six by six plates are what the public comes and builds. So uh, Lego does these a little bit differently, but uh, I do them uh, so that you can kind of do the individual panels uh, separately. Lego will paint the actual base plates themselves, and, but that's crazy ex expensive. Well, should we take some questions? Yeah, let's do some questions for sure. All right, so um, there's a couple go. of questions about sealants. So do you glue your models and what sealant is good, good to use? And have you ever made a mistake and had to try to unglue things that have been glued? Uh, yes, models are glued. If they're going to be in any sort of public contact or if they're commissioned and they're going to be permanently with somebody. Um, I use a variety of things. The one that's easiest for me to use is actually a, a Weld On 3, which is a methylene chloride, an MEC solvent. Um, it's thinner than water. It's crazy hard to work with and it will completely eat the bricks up. So once you, you can't spill it, or that brick is done. Um, MEK is like the, what we have here is a OD cement, like an ABS cement. It's lethal stuff, but it's also possible. Lego in-house uses GBL, which is really, really hard to get. Uh, I know Ryan's on, I think it's totally illegal in Australia. You can't use it at all. And in Canada, it's heavily controlled. I haven't been able to, to get any, so I don't even use it. But if I can get away with not gluing, I don't glue. Um, and what was the other, some of the other questions there? I can't remember. Uh, I, Not, think you, I think you answered, if you had to, if you were made a mistake and things were oh, yeah. you fix it. Yeah, in your toolkit as a Lego builder, you have a chisel and, uh, or several chisels and you have to be, you might have to shave down the studs in a spot to be able to slot in a, a fixing piece. Um, and that actually does happen uh, a lot. Uh, and that's why I prefer not to glue because then you can just fix it. If you have something glued and you have to repair it, you're going to be shaving things off and slotting in a chunk that you're going to have to glue on that's never fun yeah you can imagine you we get people to make up these little panels and uh and essentially they i usually often use plates so here's a case where we're starting a brand new mosaic you can see the base plate board prepped in the back and we've got little trays all with numbers those are not lego numbers they're not necessarily l draw or or brick link numbers it's kind of a hybrid of the two uh, but they're little trays of all these colors and they, it looks so amazing to have all the colors out there. So carry on, next slide. And what happens is I create, I'm going to show you how to do this, but I'm going to, they, I create these little instruction panels and we basically hand a little baggie with a, with a, a six by six plate and a little instruction sheet and all the numbers are there and they bake the panel and it's numbered like a spreadsheet cell with a letter, a row, a row and a number, uh, a row and a column, and uh, we put it on the board. So we, let's carry on. Next slide shows an example of us doing two of these at the same time, which was interesting. Um, and this was for Capital, Capital City Comic Con in Victoria. And uh, so you've got, you've got people putting on based on the little panel that they're making in the specific spot that's indicated. And uh, it works like a charm. Of course, this is all pre-COVID. So COVID changed everything. And now the few that I've done, we're actually having staff help uh, people that come to do each individual one. It's crazy. I, I don't think it's a sustainable method, but we, uh, we'll see how we go. I think what will have to probably happen is have to simplify the mosaics so that there are less colors. Both of these mosaics and the one I'm gonna show you use 25 different Lego colors. So there's like three blues, there's three reds, etc. So the public doesn't know dark red from regular red from magenta. So you can't just dump them in the little baggie because they won't know which is which, even though you'll, you'll see the colors get printed out. So we could do a simpler one though. So that's probably the way to do it. 
Anyway, uh, moving on, I'm going to take you through how I would design a mosaic. So often I'll work with, uh, with designers, uh, with artists, and this is a, a guy named, by the name of Daniel Jean-Baptiste from Montreal, phenomenal silk artist. So he paints on silk, and it's just so well suited. I've done a couple silk artist mosaics. And this is the artwork that I got at the beginning, uh, but uh, it wasn't how the shape or size that we wanted to work with. So I worked with the artist and I kind of created the next image, which is what we actually built. So go to the next image. And if we can kind of flip back between these two. So I basically took another salmon from another painting he had done. And I know they're both males, so don't get after me for that. Maybe they're fighting, <laughs> but they're in a spawning stream. And I had to do all kinds of extending the, the bottom and extending the water on the top. There's a ton of work involved in that. That's the majority of the work doing a mosaic is preparing the image to render to get to the mosaic. So changing colors, changing saturations uh, is a huge amount of work. Luckily, the silk artist stuff has massive contrast. It's really good for mosaics. So I like, I like a program called, old school program called Pick to Brick. This is shareware. It's available. P-I-C-T-O-B-R-I-C-K. I don't know who made it, but it's amazing. So it has the, whatever the render, rendering algorithms are in it, it's fabulous. It does a great job of doing the renders. There's basically two kinds, essentially two kinds of rendering that you can do. If you look carefully at the actual rendered image on the bottom, one is but more dithered and it uses the collection of different colored dots to create sort of a, a feeling of the color. Uh, and then the other, the first method uh, is, uh, is basically bands of solid color. Different images suit themselves to different um, types of mosaics. And I'll often use pieces of them in different styles. In this case, I went all with the, uh, the, the, vectored, the vectored dithering one. So that's the second one. So once you got that, you're gonna go back and forth between your Photoshop or whatever, changing all this stuff and re-rendering, re-rendering. And eventually you'll get to an image that you think, okay, it's close enough. And then I switch it over and I take this rendered image, this final image, which still is going to need work, but I now bring that into a very old school program called Brickzaic. And you know, a lot of you in the Pacific Northwesters will recognize Brickzaic. Bob Kojima of Brick Shirts uh, wrote this program back in the 1800s, I think. I think it's even written in Pascal um, or something, some archaic language. And, and for a few years, he still had the source code and managed to help us update some of the things, some of us mosaic builders. But essentially it's not changed in the past 10 years. Uh, and it's, uh, but it's fabulous. It does all the right things. And we've managed to get it tweaked to do, to work it really well for events. The cool thing about Brickzaic is you can edit. So you can edit with all your colors and you can also select what your palette is. So on the top left, I, and I can I figure out how to hack the config files and get all the Lego colors in there, uh, even the new colors when they come out, and I can edit pixel by pixel. So on an image like this, I would go in and, and, and fix up the eyes. Uh, pick to, yeah, pick to brick is with a K as well, by the way. I see the, the chat coming up. And uh, yeah, so I would edit the eyes. I would edit things and get them to a point where I felt it looked really good. I end up probably in a mosaic like this, probably edit up about edit maybe 800 to 1,000 of the pixels um, and just clean things up. Then, thanks to Bob, let's go back to that last image. Bob created the, the ability to let us, to let the print out the mosaic instructions in this format, which was, that's the, that's the, the holy moment. So essentially he printed them up, lets me print these out in pages uh, with all these panels on it. And this is, I get, I cut these up manually. Uh, and uh, these are the little instruction sheets. So you can see that every color has a number. Uh, every box has a little number in it. And this is what we use. So rows along the top, I mean, uh, yeah, columns along the top in letters and rows along the side in numbers. And away we go. So these are what people do to work with. So let's go to the next slide. And here's one in progress. The, this is the, that actual mosaic being built on site by, uh, by kids. And carry on. And there's the finished mosaic. So that is now hanging in a shopping mall in Victoria. And um, yeah, that's, that's there, it's still there. It's not glued. 
I cover the edges and people don't figure out that you can actually bring a needle nose pliers and start picking one by one plates off of there. It doesn't happen. When it happens, it'll be gone, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and that's how I do mosaic. So I use pick to brick and brickzaic and then whatever graphic editing software that you of your of your choice. Uh, Photoshop, I actually have uh, an old ancient version of Macromedia Fireworks 2004. Ama again, amazing color rendering. Uh, Photoshop absorbed that company and they lost some of the finesse of it, in my opinion. So I still use some really, really old software, but boy, does it work great. Uh, I'd recommend uh, pick to brick and Brixic. You can do this in, in studio. You can do it in other applications, Photoshop itself and a bunch of other places, but this works for me and I produce good stuff. Yeah, Paint Shop Pro is, is good as well. Um, yeah, so that's, I just wanted to give you guys an, an overview of kind of the LCP thing and then a couple of the tools and stuff to do some of the big builds and um, especially the mosaics. So we've got a few minutes left, some more questions. All right, we have lots of questions. Yeah, pick your pick the best. I'll, I'll scan the uh, chat as well. Um, so what, there's a couple of questions about what is the process to become an LCP and what, how do you, how, what's, what makes you successful? The process is uh, right now, it's basically that your a, a local business unit, a Lego entity has to request it. So at this point, it's essentially regional. So uh, it's, it's somebody in your region uh, that's defined differently for different places requests Lego that they, they want to have an LCP. That doesn't mean you're going to do a lot of work for that else, that, that Lego business unit, but that's just how it works at this point. Asia is the big hotspot right now. Uh, China, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, Japan, Korea. Uh, that's where all the new LCPs are, are coming from. I'm, I was LCP number one and I do a little bit of a different thing. I do mostly event based stuff. Uh, whereas those guys are doing a ton of work for the Lego company, creating uh, large models and things. All right, thank you. Um, and you had mentioned that LCPs can no longer make custom sets, but they used to be able to. What, what was the change and, and what do you think about that? Uh, I didn't like it. I mean, I absolutely love doing the custom sets. Um, you know, I've had to get some special dispensation from Lego to do even say the brick can sets and things like that, which you may have seen in the slides. We might've skipped over them, but uh, uh, all those sets and stuff are, are all for, through that whole program. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan of that choice. Uh, we weren't given a ton of reasons. Uh, I understand, of course, the Lego company wants to differentiate between the sets that they put on a shelf and sets that look similar, but are from an LCP. Uh, and they also, of course, don't necessarily have all the control over how we do the building instructions, the building techniques and things like that, even though we're all super careful about that and we've been trained in a lot of that stuff. But that was a decision that was made. It wasn't popular, uh, but here we are. So I see a question here that I'm also curious about. Uh, how are the base plates for the big mosaics connected? Is there a big plexi plate behind them or are they glued? They're often glued. Uh, when I do them, I, I use double-sided tape, um, a very thin double-sided tape, and I screw them on as well. And I'll, uh, that's how I do them. Yeah, and it's, it's enough. It works. You could use uh, various kinds of epoxies or glues to glue, glue them onto whatever surface you want, acrylic, whatever. You can do all, uh, it's, uh, it's a many different ways of doing it. But yeah, the, the base plates are not connected to each other at all. No, generally. Um, what is your approach for, for pricing a commission and, and how do you come up with that? I'm horrible at it. I'm horrible at it. I always estimate wrong. Um, but it's, it's time and materials, you know, it's basically what's, what's the materials going to cost, uh, and what, how much time is it going to take me for design, uh, production, gluing, uh, and delivery, delivery costs and things like that. So that's just where it comes up. And then there's a, there's a margin on that for whatever I want to actually make. Um, yeah, it's as simple as that, but I'm terrible at it. I, I avoid commissions mostly because I, I just, I've, I never seem to get it right. Uh, others are really good at that, but I just can't seem to get it right. So that's why I like doing the live events and COVID has put a, a real stop to those for the past few months. So we're trying to figure out how we can do it. 
Yeah, so I don't know if this is this is probably outside the scope, but there's a lot of people that want to know your storage system and want to see your build space. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> uh, storage is really hard because you can imagine if you have, you know, you've got a bin for white two by fours and then you have a project where you needed 60,000 of them. Um, okay, well, you're, you used 48,000. Now you have 12,000 more. Where are they going to go? So they're gonna, not going to fit in the space you had. So you're going to have overflow. So how does the overflow work? And then when you get some more later on, how many do you want to have on hand for what you're building? It's crazy. So I kind of have a very complicated system and it's, it's never up to date. So I always have things that are not sorted or not put away. And I have things that are most of it, this color or this type is here. And then the rest are over in there. So uh, yeah, it's, it's really difficult but I kind of have three levels. I have, a, I have a, a, a first level with just drawers of most of the parts, maybe 90% of what I would use for, for a design. And then I'll have a next level where I have more of those parts on a nearby shelf in my studio in boxes, in Ziplocs, so they don't take a, a very efficient spacing. And then I have a third level in storage units that are offsite that are big boxes of other brick. So it's kind of three levels deep. Um, and it works okay, but it's, you're not, you don't have easy access to hundred percent of what you're, what you're building with, which is frustrating. It breaks up the, the design process. But okay. It's, it's we workable. only have time. We only have time for about one more question. All right. So, um, okay. there were so many questions that are not being addressed. I'm so sorry. We didn't have time for it. Um, are you going to be back at Scarebike fan weekend anytime oh, soon? Oh my goodness. I went in 2017. Uh, the year that Chris came and uh, Chris McVeigh, who, who had a great presentation. I absolutely want to go back to Scareback. Scareback is amazing. Uh, beautiful place and uh, fantastic con. Great idea. Essentially like going to summer camp for AFOLs. It's fantastic. You're all in cabins. It's like a giant frat party for a week. Um, yeah, so absolutely. I want to go to Japan, the Japanese fan weekend, which is also something I really would like to go to next when we can travel again. And by the way, guys, uh, Robin at Brickville.ca, uh, send me an email. I'm happy to answer more questions. I'm gonna be hanging out uh, in other places. You can just ping me on, on Discord as well. Uh, happy to answer questions even after the weekend. Uh, yeah, chat with me for sure. Facebook, um, I have an Instagram presence and I am there, but I hardly, hardly update. I have to start doing that more. Hey, Robin, here's a question. Do you ever yeah. mess up and have to unglue pieces to go back and make corrections? Well, That's you can't question. unglue, first of all. There's no such thing. Like I said, it's chisel. Like you, when, once the, and the, and the, the stuff I use, the MEC, uh, it basically bonds in 10 seconds. Um, and it's, it's cured within an hour. So MEK, which LEGO used to use, is a, bit, a tiny bit more forgiving, but MEC is not. And once that glue is on there and it's touched, um, it's never coming apart. In fact, if you have it, you have it glued, and then you were to take, like, say, glue a couple of, uh, you know, one by four bricks together, and then try and break them apart, the brick, the brick will break first, before that bond does. After that does they're not cured, surprise me. <laughs> so that's why you just have to break it off or chisel it off. Controlled breakage, pliers, you know, ripping stuff off, and then chisel it smooth, and then slide another piece in there. It's very, Here's very ugly. Here's another question for you. Do you have any permanent or temporary staff or are you just a one man show? Yeah, good question. I didn't bring that up. I, I just, I, a couple times over the years, I had opportunity to grow and do a big exhibit like guys like Ryan and other ones have done. And uh, a couple times I tried it uh, and, you know, just didn't work out. It's really tough finding people you can work with and, and uh, people that have the whole package, good builders, good with the public. Uh, you know, can move and be adjust, be flexible to what the kind of thing that this takes. In the, long story short, I've stayed as sole proprietor, stayed on my own and have hired, like I said, a club members often will go and if it's a paid gig, we'll pay them in the, in the place where they are. Uh, so lots of subcontractors um, uh, or temporary, temporary help. It's, it's always been temporary help, sometimes for months, but not full time and then I'm not permanent. Well, I'm always available, wink, wink. So <laughs> see, I get a lot of that. So there's a lot, there's a, there's a great pool of fantastic people and fantastic builders. Uh, I mean, there's probably 20 people in the local Vancouver club uh, that have worked for me or with me uh, over the years. 
I mean, Fantastic when Br 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 started Brickville out with uh, Brickville Design Works is the name of my, my company. And uh, we started out with a, a guy named by the name of Scott Falez, who is not kind of not in the hobby anymore. But Paul Hetherington, Paul Hetherington, mm -hmm. Paul and, and Scott and I, we were the Brickville guys. So mm -hmm. for a year, we worked all worked together. And then Paul kind of figured out that he didn't really like to make what other people told him to make. Uh, he didn't want to make a six foot tall toothbrush. He wanted to do his own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so he just, we, he, he gracefully bowed out. And of course we were, he's worked for me temporarily and stuff. And we've done tons of stuff together and we're, um, we're great friends. Uh, but it just wasn't for him uh, at the time. Uh, he's dipping his foot back in the water now. But uh, yeah, but anyway, it's, it's, it's just been, and I was so thankful I don't have employees when COVID hit. Yeah. I mean, I felt for the other LCPs, there are guys with big shops with dozens of people on their staff. Ryan's got a whole bunch of people, uh, all the guys in Europe, a lot of big shops. And, you know, there's just no work. Like, these guys were having to figure out how they're going to handle, you know, these, their fam these guys and their families, um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. what they're going to do. So I did not have that problem which was a lot of stress that I didn't have to deal with so I was thankful it has been a rough crazy year thank you so much Robin